Hi everyone, I'm Jack. I'm a cloud computing engineer at CERN. And in this presentation, I'd like to show how we set up our ingress infrastructure that we use as part of the web services we provide at CERN. The purpose of this presentation is not really to show how you should set up your own ingress infrastructure, but instead to highlight some of the tools that we are using so that you can add them to your own tool belt and reach for them next time you have a particular problems or a challenge for building your infrastructure. But first, what is CERN actually? CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research based just outside of Geneva, right on the border between Switzerland and France. Below the ground, we have this accelerator called the Large Hadron Collider, which is in fact the largest machine in the world, that we use to accelerate tiny, tiny particles almost to the speed of light. We then collide these particles into each other and study what is happening during the interaction. To analyze this, we have gigantic sensors and detectors. These record what is happening during the collisions, and that data then gets streamed to our data, data center that is on premises, where the data is being filtered, stored on disk and tape, and then later analyzed by scientists all around the world. We do this to understand how our universe is made of and, and where it's coming from, what happened during the Big Bang. You might also know that this guy also used to work at CERN, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And while he was there, he invented this nifty thing called the World Wide Web, a means for researchers to exchange information and ideas and to reference those information by using hyperlinks. It's quite a neat idea. Some of you might have heard of it. Today, more than 30 years later, we still have web services, and the web services infrastructure at CERN has grown to be based on Kubernetes. Specifically, we're using OKD, the open source version of OpenShift, uh, because it provides excellent high availability, seamless in-place upgrades, and excellent multi-tenancy features. So things such as namespace isolation and RBAC rules already out of the box. We deploy this in our internal OpenStack cloud, so that is also running in our data center, and we enhance OKD with additional components and features on top to better integrate it with the CERN computing environment. This includes the Ingress infrastructure that we'll be talking about today, but also other topics such as authentication, resource management, backups, and most importantly also integrating with the various storage systems that we have at CERN so that our users can actually access their data. We extensively use operators, controllers, and webhooks within the Kubernetes cluster, uh, both off-the-shelf ones and custom-written ones, to keep the support workload for us low, because we're just a small team doing this, but also to avoid the user having to create tickets and then wait for someone to resolve it. That's why, wherever possible, we try to automate as much as possible. Our web services also have a very diverse use case. We have technical and non-technical users. Some people who know exactly what they want to do and others who just want to have a basic website. We have people who just want to deploy standard off-the-shelf software, uh, like for example a discourse forum, whereas others want to deploy the, the Python or Java application that they develop themselves, for example to analyze and visualize some data. Some websites are very simple, they're just static content, whereas others are complex web applications that require databases, caches, message queues, and a whole bunch of workers in the background. Some websites are meant for end users that you can visit in a browser, 
whereas others are meant for machine consumption, such as software repositories or APIs. All of this means that our, the web services infrastructure that we provide needs to satisfy a whole different set of requirements. For this reason, we have divided our infrastructure into several different use cases that are served by different cluster flavors, but they all build on the same shared base. On the most basic level, we have our platform as a service where a user can deploy any Docker image that they grab off the internet or that they build themselves, and they can do the usual Kubernetes things within their own projects. We also have an app catalog where we provide commonly used applications pre-configured in a way that they fit into the CERN computing environment. So an example here is WordPress websites that already have CERN authentication set up are using the CERN internal databases and the storage systems. Then there's also the web EOS case, which is essentially exposes part of the EOS file system that at CERN is used to store all of the experiment data. So this is very useful if you just want to share a particular subset of the data or may, maybe make some visualizations on top. And finally, the most advanced use case is our Drupal cluster, which is currently, Drupal is the most widely used CMS at CERN, where our colleagues from the Drupal team have developed a very sophisticated operator that takes care of setting up the Drupal websites, managing database upgrades in the background, applying schema migrations, etc. Now, for some, for some numbers about this infrastructure, we're hosting somewhere around 8,000 unique host names on this infrastructure. And depending on the cluster flavor, we see quite varied usage patterns as well. So the app catalog and Drupal clusters, which are more end user facing websites, have overall lower traffic compared to PaaS and WebEOS, where we have a lot of machine traffic, for example, other machines downloading software packages. These numbers are not here to impress or to brag because we are aware that we are not Cloudflare or Google or Facebook, but it just shows what can be done with standard off-the-shelf software on-premises. Some examples for websites that we host are the CERN homepage. I don't think I need to explain why it's important for any organization that your homepage is always available and uh, accessible for users. We also host some exter external projects such as Zenodo, which is a platform for researchers to deposit and share their research outputs, including not only the publications, but also the data they use, the software, and other digital artifacts. This is in fact our highest bandwidth view that, that we have, because these data sets that are associated to the papers are downloaded from all over the world. And they tend to be quite large as well. Another funny example is the LHC page one, which is the main online status display of the Large Hadron Collider. It shows the overall state and the most important parameters of the accelerator at any given moment. It is publicly accessible, so you can actually visit this link, but at the moment there is nothing interesting to see because we are in a technical stop, meaning it's a maintenance period. But be sure to check back again next week for more, more information. Now, what does the user actually need to do to get to this result that we just saw, to get to a website? Well, they should deploy an application, either using our PaaS or one of the pre-configured um, services that we have. Uh, they can use a, a standard uh, Docker image for this. They create a service and they need to make it externally available by creating an ingress or a route for it. All of this can also be done through the OKD web interface, which is actually one of the reasons why we chose OKD as the base for our platform as a service, because it provides a very user-friendly interface. So you can do all of this, what is shown on the left side, um, just by using the, the web interface with a few simple clicks. 
and the user does not need to know anything about Kubernetes details, what is the service, how does the route work. Behind the scenes, this will generate a route object like this. Small side mark here, for those of you that are not familiar, OpenShift uses routes because at the time um, that this was conceived with OpenShift 3 in 2015, Kubernetes did not even have the concept of ingresses yet. They were only added later on, and then they were alpha and beta, and only graduated to stable in 2019. That's why, to this day, OpenShift still has these routes instead of ingresses, though you can also use ingresses on OpenShift. Personally, I also much prefer routes because they are way simpler than the deeply nested structure of ingresses, but that's just my personal opinion. So essentially what this route describes is where traffic should be routed to, so in this case a particular service, and it describes some parameters about how the TLS should be set up, so in this case it's an encrypted connection that gets terminated by the ingress controller. We can see that we have not specified a host yet because we will come to that later how we actually do that. Behind the scenes now we need to do several things for this website to actually appear to the user. Firstly, we need to check if the hostname that the user chose or did not choose complies with our restrictions and fits into our setup and our computing environment. We also need to make sure that the hostname is not already used somewhere else to avoid conflict. Then we need to assign the route to an appropriate ingress controller, because as we will see later, we are having multiple ingress controllers in each cluster. We need to apply any possible firewall restrictions, such as should this website be accessible only from the intranet or also from the internet. Then we need to publish DNS records for the hostname, so the client knows to which server to talk to. And finally, we need to provide a TLS certificate, because that's just a given for any website. The typical flow for creating an object in Kubernetes, such as a route or an ingress, is the following, and I'm showing it here to help us understand in which order the components are working. So the request gets sent by the client to the Kubernetes API server to please create this object. The Kubernetes API server will then validate the open API schema, and if it's valid, it will then invoke a series of admission webhooks. There are two types of admission webhooks. There are validating admission webhooks that can perform additional checks that are not able to be done just by an open API uh, schema. This includes, for example, if a particular field is set, then another set of fields needs to be set to a specific value as well. Once these validations have passed, the Kubernetes API server then invokes the mutating admission webhook. As the name suggests, these webhooks can actually change the request on the fly. Only after the mutating webhooks have run and have possibly modified the, the requested object, the, the object then gets stored into the etcd database. Afterwards, the Kubernetes API server notifies all the components that have a watch on this particular resource kind, such as operators and controllers. Most importantly, of course, the ingress controller. But back to the topic of admission review. We use the open policy agent as a glue between various Kubernetes components. This is very helpful for us as users because it automates things, but it also helps our users because they don't need to do complicated things or we can just kind of help them if we see, hey, you should probably set up a TLS certificate. We'll see some, of, some examples of that later. But we're not only using OPA for the ingress setup, but also for adding volumes to pods or overwriting images to maybe use an internal image cache. To, to configure volumes to be backed up and set the appropriate mount permissions and enforcing additional constraints on custom resources. I should note here that OPA cannot only be used in Kubernetes, but it is a general purpose framework 
that can be used for any kind of authorization decision. So you can even embed it in your own application. Open Policy Agent uses Rego, a declarative policy language, for, these, um, for creating these policies. Basically, it works by inspecting and transforming data in structured documents. Um, and the data is twofold. It is one, the input request, but we can also preload additional data. And we make extensive use of that to provide additional context for the request. So this is an example of, an, uh, of a rego policy. In this case, it is the policy that we use for generating default host names if the user didn't specify one. Basically, we check that the input request is indeed a route object and it has not already a host name defined. If that is the case, the policy evaluation continues and we generate a default name based on the name of the route the name of the namespace, and the default domain that is used for that particular project. At the bottom, we then send back a JSON patch to the Kubernetes API server, which tells it how, in which way, the input request should be transformed before being persisted into the etcd database. We have another OPA policy that checks how, uh, that basically enforces unique host names across all of the clusters in our infrastructure. Because in our case, multiple clusters share the same DNS zones, so we must avoid conflict. To do this, we have a simple controller that dumps the contents of the DNS zones into a custom resource that uh, looks like this. So it's a reserved host name resource, and it lists out all the host names that are already used by another cluster. So not the cluster that we're currently on, but by another cluster. This data can then be preloaded into the OPA policy and also updated on the fly, just like any other Kubernetes resource. Therefore, we can use this to check if this hostname has already been used, if the hostname that is requested by the user has already been used by another cluster and rejected if necessary. We have various more OPA policies, such as enforcing firewall restrictions for IP allow and block lists, adding annotations for cert manager so that it requests certificates if that's necessary, and adding annotations for external DNS for our DNS setup. At the end, after all of these uh, webhooks have passed, the route will then look like this. So we can see that we have several more annotations for these components that I just mentioned. And also the host name has been added that was generated on the fly. That is what I meant by using OPA as glue between different components. We can connect the Ingress controller with external DNS, with cert manager, with various other things. Now, let's actually get to the heart of the whole operation, the Ingress controllers. In Kubernetes, an ingress controller is responsible for routing traffic from outside the cluster to the right place inside the cluster. This is done by dynamically reconfiguring itself based on the ingress or route objects that it's watching. OKD's built-in ingress controller is based on HAProxy, a battle-tested reverse proxy and load balancer, but there are many, many other popular implementations out there, such as the Nginx ingress controller or traffic. I should really highlight here that you can use more than one ingress controller within your cluster, either using different types of ingress controllers, such as combining HAProxy, Nginx, and traffic, so that you can better adjust or maybe choose the right tool for the right job, depending on which workload you have. But you can also do what we do, that we take the same ingress controller and set it up multiple times with different configurations. We then implement sharding between these ingress controllers by adding labels to the namespaces. So for example, in this case, this is our apps shard one, and the ingress controller apps shard one will then only react to ingress or route objects that are within a namespace that has this label and it will ignore all of the other ones 
because those get handled by other ingress controllers. Like I said, we are running several ingress controllers for each for a unique purpose in our cluster. There is the default ingress controller that we only use for our own infrastructure components, such as accessing the monitoring stack or the web console, because we want to isolate it from the user workload. We have, for example, this apps LBTN, which integrates with our technical network. So this is an external load balancer that is actually located in a different network environment and only websites that then get assigned to this particular ingress controller will be available from that network. So we can kind of traverse firewall boundaries like this. We have different apps shards for different use cases and they are configured in different ways because each of these shards basically serves a unique purpose. Apps shard 2 in our case is for, is for applications that have a lot of uh, concurrent connections open whereas Apps Chart 3 is for high bandwidth applications. And as you can see, we always assign the ingress controllers based on the namespace labels. Now, we can also see in, in, this, in this graphic that we actually have two different types of ingress controllers, or at least they are exposed in different ways. The first one that it was marked there as host network is what we call a DNS load balanced ingress controller. Basically, what this means is that the canonical domain of the ingress controller points to a set multiple IP addresses, and those are the IP addresses of the nodes which run the HA proxy pods. From there on, the traffic then gets forwarded further into the cluster to the respective services or pods. This means that our HA proxy pods run in host network mode, so it directly binds to port 80 and 443 on the node. This has the advantage that it offers maximum performance because no cluster networking is involved. Yesterday there was a very nice technical deep dive into how uh, virtual networking works inside of Kubernetes, but it also showed that there was quite a bit of magic involved. In this case, we don't have any of that magic involved, Instead, the packets directly reach the HA proxy pods, thereby uh, giving us maximum performance. The downside is, of course, that we can only have one pod per node, which means that if the pod does not actually need all of the resources of the node, we cannot schedule a second pod on the node because the, the port is already blocked. This can be somewhat mitigated by correctly choosing the size of the VM uh, that you're running these pods on. And finally, the other downside is also that we need to be very careful when doing changes in our infrastructure or at least have a very long, graceful termination for these router pods because DNS updates are slow, meaning when we remove a machine from our cluster, we also remove the IP uh, from the DNS, <coughs> but it will still get requests for a while because DNS changes take a while to propagate. The other mode that we have is an ingress controller with an external cloud load balancer. In this case, the canonical domain does not directly point to the cluster itself, but first to the static IP address that has been assigned to the external load balancer. From there, the external load balancer will forward the traffic to the node ports that have been assigned to the ingress pods. This, of course, means that you need something like a cloud controller manager to dynamically handle the updates. Uh, for example, when you're adding a new node into your cluster, that it will reconfigure the external load balancer to add a new member into the load balancer pool. This has the advantage that it's much more flexible in general and reconfiguration is faster because as soon as a node is unhealthy or doesn't re respond anymore, the external load balancer will notice that and will not send any traffic anymore there. This is something that we don't get when using a DNS load balance setup. Another advantage is that we have a static IP that we can assign to this external load balancer which is necessary, uh, as we'll see in the next step, because um, 
due to restrictions of what you're allowed to do in DNS records. However, we need to consider that now we have an additional network hop in our setup. And for us, that we operate everything on premises, it's also another infrastructure dependency that we need to keep in mind. This might not be something that, is, uh, that you are concerned about if you are running in a public cloud because you're depending on the public cloud provider anyway, but it's something for us to keep in mind that we're running on premises. We, I've also put performance question mark here because in our case, we're using um, software-based OpenStack Octavia load balancers, which we've seen um, they don't necessarily handle highly concurrent connections or many concurrent connections at the same time or high bandwidth applications particularly well. Again, maybe not your problem if you're running in a public cloud or if you have a hardware load balancer somewhere, but it's just something to keep in mind. Now, I've mentioned uh, DNS records a couple of times, and we are using external DNS to, do, to set this up. External DNS is a project that, uh, or is a component that watches services, ingresses, routes, nodes, and other objects in your Kubernetes cluster, and, then, and can then publish DNS records based on the status of these, uh, of these objects and also which annotations you add to them. So the standard setup that we have is a host name that points with a C name to the canonical domain of the ingress controller, which then contains the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses of the ingress nodes or the load balancer. Practical examples. We have a host name such as cloud.web.cern.ch. This is a C name to PAS appschart1.cern.ch, which then in turn contains the actual IP addresses. This has the advantage that it's a very flexible setup because we only need to change a single DNS record, the canonical to name, when anything changes in our infrastructure, such as we're adding a new ingress controller or a node gets removed from the cluster and the, the IP addresses of the ingress controller change. The downside, however, is that it does not work for so-called APEX or root domains, such as example.com or cern.ch because the DNS spec forbids using C names for these type of records. So you either need to use some DNS provider that, provo that supports C name flattening, so that will dynamically resolve those C names, or you need to use a static IP address, which is exactly what we're using those uh, cloud load balancers for that have a static IP address. In this case, we simply fall back to manually setting the DNS records. Finally, I'd like to touch on the topic of firewall integration because now we've discussed how our ingress controllers are set up and um, how the DNS is set up, but those machines are still running on premises in our case, which means by default they're not exposed to the internet. For this, we need to integrate with LANDB, which is CERN's central networking database. It contains the configuration of all the network devices and services, such as also firewall rules. Is this device allowed to access other devices, uh, in our case a node, or is this node allowed to be reachable from the internet because by default you are behind um, the firewall? We then, to, to avoid managing these settings for each machine individually, uh, LANDB sets, you can kind of think of this as a node group, exists that apply common policies to multiple network devices. We developed our own LANDB operator that manages these sets and their members via a custom resource that looks like this. So we have a Kubernetes resource called kind LANDB set and it has a label selector which means it will select all nodes that have this particular label. It will then create a set name, in this case, IT, OKD, PAS, staging, ingress nodes, and add all the matching nodes into that set. Behind the scenes, this actually calls into a pretty archaic SOAP API 
um, that, is, that is not very user-friendly, uh, but we don't have to really care about that because now, thanks to this operator that we developed, we can manage these resources like any other Kubernetes resource with our Argo CD GitOps setup. I would also like to touch on the topic of certificate management because in this case we have two different paths. Most of the, most of the domains or host names that we host are all in the same DNS zone, which means we can simply use a wildcard certificate for those that we, that we have gotten from a public CA. This certificate is configured as the default for the ingress controller. So if the ingress controller gets a route or an ingress and it's matching this wildcard certificate, it will simply use the, this certificate to serve the website. If that is not the case, because we have an external domain such as zenodo.org, which we saw before, we don't have a wildcard certificate for that. In this case, we use an OPA policy again, combined with third manager, to dynamically request a certificate from Let's Encrypt. Again, the purpose of this is that the user does not need to know about this, but everything is automated. Now, some of you may be wondering, why are we not just using Let's Encrypt for everything? As we saw at the beginning, uh, we have somewhere around 8,000 unique host names in our infrastructure. And Let's Encrypt enforces rate limits per domain. So all of these are under CERN.ch. And we are not allowed to simply request that many certificates. We are currently looking into maybe having our own uh, certificate provider with an ACME integration. But that's more for the future, just as an explanation why we are using a wildcard certificate here. On the topic of monitoring, I don't really have anything exciting to report. Uh, we are basically using a dual, dual approach here. We have OKD's internal, cluster internal monitoring uh, that is based on the Kube Prometheus stack, with which we check that the ingress controller resource usage is OK, uh, that the certificates in the cluster are all, are, are all up to date, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really for internally monitoring the infrastructure components. We then also use a service provided by the, by the central monitoring team at CERN that is, uh, at the end of the day, a Prometheus and black box exporter that probes our ingress controllers from the outside and uh, gives us availability metrics and end-to-end -end tests so that we can really make sure that not only is our infrastructure healthy from the inside, but it's also reachable by users. We don't really have any checks for performance due to the very diverse workload that we have and the di very different requirements that we see from the applications. If users have specific performance needs, then they are expected to set something up themselves. Now, for some, for some takeaways, I, I would like to share that we found this model of having specialized services built on a common foundation to be very, very beneficial. The fact that PAS, App Catalog, and WebEOS all have the same base means that we only need to perform upgrades uh, and validation, testing, et cetera, once, and then this can be shared across the entire infrastructure. We've also seen over the course of the last 10 years that building our own ingress infrastructure that is reliable and scalable is not only possible, but it is also possible with a small team without very specialized hardware or software. So you can do it too. Open Policy Agent is a very powerful tool for duct taping together different Kubernetes components, such as what we've seen here, um, our ingress controllers, third manager, external DNS, and custom operators that we've developed. This is the final point I'd like to make. Don't be afraid to write custom operators to interact with external resources. It can seem a little bit daunting at first, but projects such as the operator SDK make it very easy to get started. Also, over time, we haven't seen a lot of maintenance on these. It's basically set and forget for us. But in the long term, it makes cluster management much easier and reproducible, especially if you're using a GitOps approach.
Thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to invite every one of you to come visit us in Geneva. You can book a guided tour with an expert that will show you around the experiments. And you can also visit this magnificent new visitor center that is called the Science Gateway, where you can learn more about what CERN does and what we've discovered over the last 70 years. Thank you very much.